Okay, welcome everybody. So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of this uh, afternoon session, which is uh, Lucia Cordova. She will talk about uh, UV behavior of an uh, integrable model. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak here. It's a great pleasure to be in Budapest. So today I will tell you about this work uh, we put out in last year with two great collaborators, Stefano Negro and Fidel Chaposnik Masolo. And the long-term goal behind this project is to try to understand what is the space of quantum field theories. And for this talk and this conference, just the interval quantum field theories. So in practice, what uh, we did in this work is very simple. We studied different interval models defined by some S matrix. And then we solved the thermodynamic Bethe-Ansatz equations to uh, understand what are the possible UV, UV behaviors of these theories, in particular looking at the ground state energy um, of the theory in a cylinder. So uh, this is the outline of the talk. First, I will discuss some motivation. So, namely, I will talk about two possible ways in which we can explore the space of QFTs. One is irrelevant deformations, so in particular TT bar and generalized TT bar deformations. And the other one is the S matrix bootstrap. And then I will uh, review some setup and numerical method. So, as I said, we will be um, using the thermodynamic Bethe ansatz. So I will just review some things about it and um, the numerical method we're using to, to solve these equations. And then I'll pass to the results. So we started different models. One is called uh, elliptic cinch Gordon model, uh, which has infinite resonances. Another one uh, will be theories with one stable particle and uh, an arbitrary number k of resonances. And if I have time, I will also talk about, to our knowledge, a new uh, set of UV complete theories, which are related to uh, the formations of minimal models. So some bosonic analog of those. And I will end with some final remarks. Okay, so let's pass to the motivation. Uh, the first thing I wanna talk about is TT bar. So the idea is that uh, you can start with some known theory described by some action A0, and then you deform the theory with some irrelevant operator with some parameter alpha. And this operator is constructed out of the stress tensor of the theory. So even though this is an irrelevant deformation and we would expect to lose control over what we're doing, these are actually solvable in the sense that we can uh, compute exactly some observables in the deformed theory in terms of the undeformed one. Undeformed one. So for instance, uh, if we're looking at some energy level, we can see we can um, extract this energy in the deformed theory in terms of the undeformed one in this way. So uh, to give an example, if our original theory here is a CFT, we know that the ground state energy will be something like this, so central charge over R. And if we solve this equation, we will have some quadratic equation. So we get these two different branches and this form with a square root. So um, since what we are doing is more similar to one specific sign of alpha, I will focus on what happens when alpha is negative. So here I'm plotting um, this function here, well, a related one, which is the effective central charge related in this way to, to the ground state energy. And what you see is that um, you have some first branch here, which in the IR is related to our undeformed theory, the CFT, so it goes to C. But then as you go towards the UV, something happens at some critical radius, 
and you have another branch, the second branch here, merging, and below this you have some complex values. So this critical radius here gives us some Hagedorn temperature, since you can see that computing the, the entropy, you would get some um, density of states that grows exponentially with energy. So this signals some Hagedorn transition. Uh, however, oops, the, the physics of the second branch and these complex values is not understood. It's still an upper problem to give a physical interpretation to this second branch of solutions or the complex values here. And finally, something I, I'd like to remind you of is that you can also define this deformation as uh, with its effect on the S matrix. So if we have some 2 to 2 S matrix S0, the effect of this TT bar deformation is simply dressing it with some phase here. Okay, so this is about TT bar. Now I'd like to go into generalized TT bar deformations. And uh, these are relevant for, okay, I shouldn't use relevant. <laughs> But these are good for interable theories. So as we know, we have uh, infinite currents in interable theories. So we can construct other operators, irrelevant, out of these higher spin currents in a similar way to TT bar. And uh, the only thing I, I will use about these affirmations is really their S matrix definition. So since we are um, keeping integrability in the spectrum, we can parametrize this um, factor phi in terms of CDD factors. So they obey unitarity and crossing. And in general, we can um, express it in this way. So there is a part which is expressed in terms of uh, rational CDD factors. And another one which gives you an entire function and has this exponential form. So for the TBA, it's easier to understand this exponential form. It was already done in this paper here. It basically dresses the, sorry, changes the dressing term, driving term. And, uh, but this other product of uh, rational CD factors is not well understood what happens in the TBA. So we will focus on this part here. And also, since we're keeping the spectrum of the theory, um, these parameters theta j should be such that they give only zeros in the physical strip of the S matrix, so they are resonances. The effect of uh, this factor here is to introduce resonances to your theory. So, yeah, I will focus on these rational CD factors. And now let me pass into to, uh, another approach we can take into studying the space of QFTs, and this is the S-matrix bootstrap. So the idea is quite different in principle. What we want to do here is explore the space of consistent S-matrices, that is, S-matrices that are compatible with unitarity, crossing, and analyticity. And what one does is to set up some optimization problem in which you put bounds on the space of couplings. So this allows us to have some nice pictures of theories that are allowed inside, some volume, and they are disallowed outside. So this approach is quite general. You can use it for any QFT. But if you do it for 2D theories, then interable, theory, interable theories um, come up naturally. So they usually saturate bounds, and they live at some special points in this allowed region. So um, to give an example, there is this monolith here, which is a space of allowed theories with some ON global symmetry and no bound states. And if you just plot a subsection of the allowed space, you see that it has some very interesting geometrical features, and that at cusps of this object, you have some interesting theories. Well, one is just free theory, then 
there's another cusp here, which is the ON nonlinear sigma model, another interval S matrix. And there's also another point here, sitting on a special point, which is also interval, and it's what we call periodic Jan Baxter model. So the S matrix was actually written down a long time ago here, um, but it has some funny properties. So one of them is that uh, it is periodic in the real rapidity. So it tells you that the S matrix looks the same at different energies, which sounds strange. And also, there are infinite resonances in this theory. So um, there is no known model to it, no Lagrangian. However, you see it popping up at, at some special point in the monolith. And um, Generically, also for non-interval theories, you see that S matrices living here at the boundary of the allowed region also have infinite resonances. So it seems to be a generic feature of these optimal solutions. But of course, um, we would like to understand if these are physical theories, and in particular, what's the UV nature of the models with such S matrices. Okay, so even though these approaches seem quite different, you see that they share various things in that in the end we're considering some consistent S matrices and trying to figure out what are the features of the models giving these S matrices. So this is the motivation. Now let me go to the setup. So, as I said, we will be using the thermodynamic Bethe ansatz, which you'll probably know very well, but let me review some aspects. So, the idea is that you put your theory in some finite size cylinder of circumference R, and you want to compute the ground state energy. And this ground state energy, you um, compute it by uh, solving this equation for the pseudo energies here. And in, in this case, and most of what I will say, there will only be one stable particle of mass M. So it's a single equation you need to solve. And the input about the theory is inside this kernel here, where the S matrix appears. So here I'm also writing two possible signs, depending on the type of S matrix that we have. So if at theta equals zero, it's minus one, it's fermionic, and plus one, it's bosonic. And uh, finally, we also have this parameter r, which is some um, dimensionless um, parameter uh, given by the, the radius and, and the mass of the stable particle. Sorry, I'm still dealing with some post-COVID throat. All right. so. Once you have these pseudo energies, you can compute the effective central charge with this equation, which is related to the ground state energy in this way. But for now on, I will just plot this function here. So in a typical scenario, what we would find is the following. So since we're dealing with some massive theory, in the IR, we have just a trivial CFT, so it goes to zero. And then in the UV, we should recover the UV CFT. So we would get uh, the, the UV central charge minus the, the dimension of the lowest operator. So for unitary theories, it's just a central charge. So it looks like this for the conventional theories. But we will be dealing with something more like TTR. Okay, so now, um, before passing through to the numerical method, uh, let me review some analytic aspects of it. So in general, it's very hard to solve these equations analytically, but uh, we can say some things about certain limits. So in this very nice paper, which uh, we're doing some sort of follow-up, really, um, it was explained what are the possible asymptotics in the IR, so when R goes to infinity. So there are basically two options. One is that the pseudo energy goes like R cos theta, and this gives you the, the usual scenario here, 
with C going to zero. And another possibility is that instead it goes like minus R times some other function, and this function changes sign. So it's positive in some region of the real line. And this will give rise to something that instead of going to zero, goes like R squared, which is the same as for TT bar, except that uh, for TT bar you have uh, that the pseudo energy goes like this, but it's only possible for that particular kernel. If not, then the other possibility is just this one. And in order to have the second branch, a necessary condition is that the kernel satisfy this, this uh, equation, well, inequality. So the L1 norm of the kernel should be bigger than one. And what this integral does for you is basically it counts the number of resonances minus bound states in the theory. So this is an important condition because it tells you that if you have more bound, sorry, more resonances than bound states in your theory, then the second branch of solutions is allowed. So this is for the IR, but it doesn't tell us if you could have some bifurcations at some finite R, or in general what happens at finite R, but it's already a good, uh, um, a good thing that you have this, this condition explicitly. And the other thing I, I will use is that in the UV, when R goes to zero, if your solutions tend to some plateau, which is often the case, then one can use the so-called dialog trick to compute the central charge. So you would compute it in terms of this L function, which is on the logarithm and logarithm, in terms of the pseudo energy at the constant value of the plateau. So this we will use as well. Okay, so now let's go into the numerical method. I don't want to spend too much time on it because I'd rather talk about the results. But okay, so I said it's really hard to solve in general this equation. It's linear, there's some integration. So what we usually do is to solve this iteratively. So we start with some seed pseudo energy, which is often this R cos theta. Input it here, get the iteration number one, and do this repeatedly until this equation converges and the difference between iterations is small enough. And you need to do this for each R. So you fix R, you solve it, you change some that R, and you do it again. Um, so this method is, has many advantages. Mainly, it's very simple to implement, and when it works, it works very well. However, it's difficult to deal with turning points or bifurcations. So basically, this iteration stops converging for some R. And it could even be just some instability, so it doesn't find a, a solution, but it doesn't really mean that you have necessarily some physical singularity in your equations. So what we can do instead is think about the solutions. So what we want to find is the curve of solutions to the TBA, which um, for visual purposes, you can think about the C function. And we want to follow this curve by changing R here, but this is not the best parameter for the curve. What you can do instead is parameterize this curve in terms of the arc length, S, so that your variables are now functions of this arc length. And then you move a step delta s away in this curve. So in a cartoon, what you would do is, suppose you have already a, a solution to the TBA, so some point in the curve, x0, that you could get, could get, for instance, with this iterative method. Then you want to find some other point, x1, delta s away, in this solution curve. So if you compute the tangent vector here to this point, basically you need to solve these two equations. One that tells you that you are delta s away from your original point, so somewhere along here. And another one that tells you that you're actually solving the equations 
in this case, the TBA equations, so that you're here. And in practice, one does this through some predictor corrector method. So you have some initial guess for the solution here along the tangent vector. And then you can use some Newton-like method to, to go into the actual solution. But, uh, okay, it's a bit abstract, but the punchline it's, is that um, there is a very well-known method in the numerics community. You can see, for instance, this book to deal with, the, with these turning points and bifurcations. So we can implement it in the TBA and it works very well. All right, so now let me talk about the results. And as a warm up, let me tell you about the fermionic and bosonic singe Gordon model. So this is really the, the simplest test matrix. It's just one CD factor, a single resonance. So in the rapidity plane, you have only one zero here in the physical strip at some theta equals i pi a, and then you have the crossing um, symmetric zero here. So it's a very simple S matrix, and for the fermionic model, really the singe Gordon model, we know the Lagrange and everything, and we have a, a normal flow. So we have uh, C equals one here in the UV, and we flow to zero in the IR. And if you change A, then it changes a bit how you get from one to zero, but y you only have, uh, yeah, you have the same in the UV and the IR. So this is standard. But what happens if you consider instead a minus sign in front of this CDD? And this was already uh, studied partially in this work by Musard and Simon in 99. So they saw that the TBA stops, stops converging at some point and it should have some complex solutions um, below that. So we just ran the numerics for different A's and got all the solutions um, to the TBA equations with a minus sign here. So you can see that the critical radius depends on the details of the theory. So here this coupling A. And, um, but if you go to the UV, you get the same thing. And this value here, one half plus 0.6i, you can get explicitly from this uh, delogarithm trick uh, with this function here where the constant solutions to the TBA are basically the solutions to this equation. So you're solving the TBA at r equals zero with epsilon constant. So um, I will talk more about this later, but basically one can think of this extra minus sign as adding some other resonance to the fermionic model. So if we go back to the condition on the kernel counting resonances minus bound states, we see that then um, it makes sense that we have these two branches because it's really like having two resonances in the fermionic theory. All right, so this is a warm up. Now, uh, another model we studied is the elliptic singe cordon. So instead of one resonance, you have infinity. And it's also periodic in the real rapidity plane. So real rapidity direction. And the S matrix is basically the same CD factor, but now you change the signs to some Jacobi signs. And now instead of just A, some parameter, you have two, L here, the modulus, which um, if you look into the analytic structure, it's what gives you the period, so the spacing between different zeros, the resonances in the theory. So some limits of this S matrix is that when A goes to zero, you recover free theory. And uh, another limit is when this period goes to infinity, and this is when you recover the singe cordon model with just one resonance. So we did this for many A's and L's, and this is our representative of what we find. So we see that we have a situation more like TT bar. So there are indeed two branches in the IR, but you always have two branches. Now it's just uh, uh, complex and they're complex conjugate to each other. Um, 
And you see again that this critical radius depends on the parameters of the theory. So here both on A and L. Here I'm plotting varying L and keeping A fixed, but we did it for, for both, varying both. And uh, another thing to notice is that in the UV, this effective central charge goes to zero. So it's very much like TT bar, and it actually makes sense because you can approximate the TT bar um, S matrix as some infinite product of CD factors. So just to show how this radius varies with A, A and L. Um, so for the bosonic model, we have this orange line, and the fermionic is this blue one. So if you keep L fixed and vary A, you have something like this. So it varies, not so much. And uh, here I'm also plotting, for reference, the bosonic cinch cordons, or just one resonance. And if you vary L instead, um, you see that the critical radius changes, and that as L goes to zero, you should recover the cinch cordon model. So indeed, the bosonic one goes to this value. And the fermionic one goes to zero, as it should, because the fermionic cinch cordon model doesn't have this critical radius. OK, so we did one resonance and infinity. Now let's do everything in between. So uh, before that, let me talk about this map between fermionic and bosonic TBA. So basically, if you have some bosonic TBA equation, you can map it to a fermionic one if you do this identification between the pseudo-energies and the kernels. Note that the kernel has some extra delta function. And this delta function, you can see it as the limit of one um, CDD factor where the mass of the resonance goes to zero. So this is why uh, the bosonic cinch cordon is like two resonances in the fermionic one. So, yeah, in general, you have this map between k plus one resonances in the fermionic and k in the bosonic. So let's stick to the fermionic ones. And, uh, well, we run numerics for various values of k's and then just uh, computed some um, uh, analytic uh, behavior in the UV. So we indeed saw all these plateau solutions arising in the UV, so we can just use this dialog trick. And basically, the equation you need to solve in the UV is this one here, where y is, well, the y function, which is exponential of minus pseudo energy. So you see that this will give, in general, k different solutions. However, in the TBA, you only have two, two complex conjugate. And the two that are picked by the TBA uh, is actually the two that would minimize the absolute value of the central charge in the UV. So we find this very curious. And in pictures, you can see how this happens. So um, for k equals two in the fermionic, which is like the bosonic cinch cordon, you find two, oh, two solutions here. Um, for k equals three, you find three. But the two that are picked by the TBA are these two ones. And well, you go on and on, and you see that as you increase k, you're basically populating this unit circle here. And the ones that uh, the TBA chooses are the ones that are closer to y equals zero. So if you instead um, see what this means for the central charge in the UV, and you plot this in the complex plane, so this is real part and imaginary part, you can see how it changes as you increase the number of resonances. So for k equals two, you recover this number, one half plus 0.6i, and you increase k and you go along this curve, and if k is very large, then this number goes to zero, as we saw for the elliptic cinch cordon. So I, I find this quite cute. Um, and the punchline is that we always get just two branches and some sort of C-minimization. So, yeah, 
Now, uh, what about theories with more stable particles? What about S matrices with bound states? So this is oh, <laughs> largely unexplored, but something we did was to study some very simple S matrices that arise with this phi 1, 3 deformation of the non-unitary minimal models to 2n two plus 3. So now you have n different particles, um, and the rest matrices are given by CDD poles. Um, so we want to see uh, what we would get from theories like this. This one is well known, so you know that in the UV you would get um, this effective central charge uh, corresponding to 2n two, two plus 3. And what we did was to um, deform this theory in the simplest way possible. So we're just adding, multiplying by a minus sign, an overall minus sign everywhere. And what we found is that actually you still have some UV complete theory. So um, you don't have any turning points or anything. And um, we computed these numbers for different ends. And here is uh, the label of the minimal model and the number of particles. This is for n equals 3, but we did it for many others. Um, sorry, I should explain better this plot. So in black, you have the total, the effective central charge, and in blue, the contribution of each type of particle. So it goes for n equals 3 to some number, 0.72, something, something. So it would be great if we could construct uh, some physical model for this theory. We don't know, um, we didn't see anything in the literature. And moreover, except for n equals 1, uh, it seems to be some irrational number. So if these numbers speak to you and you know what they are, please let me know. So yeah, this is just one exploration, but of course we, we can do more with uh, bound states. Okay, so let me end with some final remarks. So uh, we analyzed the TBA equations for different models, mainly with one stable particle and an arbitrary number of resonances, both in their bosonic and fermionic flavor. And in all cases, except for singe Gordon or k equals 1 in the fermionic model, there is a turning point in the TBA with two branches. And something that is new to our work is that we were able to follow all the solutions all the way to the UV and find these complex solutions. And uh, yes, I said we always have two branches. And there is this curious fact that the UV solutions are such that C is minimized. So regarding more stable particles, I talked about some new to our knowledge family of UV complete theories, but it would be great if we could really classify if we have n bound states and k resonances, what are the UV complete theories and what are the ones that are not. And here I should point out some recent work um, which goes in this direction, but for massless flows. So uh, one punchline of the talk is that we find evidence to this conjecture that really the, the determining factor to get uh, a critical radius or a Hagedorn temperature is the fact that the number of resonances and bound states is less or bigger than one. And the second punchline I want to make is that most consistent S matrices that we can think of will not be the conventional, will not have the conventional UV fixed point, simply because you can always add some CD factors with resonances. And um, since we find these complex solutions and some sort of C minimization, it is very tempting to think that in the UV, maybe there are some complex CFTs um, uh, behind all this. But this is something we need to explore further. So we need to um, do some excited TBA to learn about excited states, maybe do some conformal perturbation theory. But um, the message I want to give is that instead of just uh, 
discarding this series as unphysical right away. Perhaps with these universal features, we can try to understand what they can teach us. And with this, I'll end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice uh, seminar, an interesting seminar. Are there any questions? Okay, I may start uh, with a question. So, uh, the fact that you only have uh, square root uh, singularity, can you prove it uh, through TBA? I mean, is it due to the particular specific form of TBA where you have this uh, integral over the real axis? What, what uh, so, I don't know how to do it analytically, but in all numerics we did, it's really happening, so maybe, yeah, there is a way to do it, but uh, we don't know, yeah, we don't know how to get these critical radios starting from this, some S matrix, get some analytic function, we, we don't know. So, there is no way of forcing the solution in the ultraviolet to be one of the other solution, uh, the other effective central charge you get. Uh, so um, is it, um, you know, can, yes, can, so can you think about a way of forcing the, the, the system to... Yeah, I, I understand what you mean. So, one thing, numerically it's very hard to do R equals zero. <laughs> but if you do finite R, like close to R equals zero, you can actually be sure that there are only two branches because, yeah, uh, in the numerics, we can do perturbations and just explore this, uh, this space, and you always land on just two solutions. And moreover, for K large, um, the solutions, you have many solutions uh, close, so they would also be close in the TBA, well, in effective central charge. And so you should be able to find it with perturbations, and, and you don't. So. Yeah, I think, uh, no, you, you just have these two. Okay, yes. So, see, since you did this extensive numerics, I was wondering, have you tried to fit sort of the correction to the central charge? Because from this you can figure out the, the dimension of, of the perturbing operator. Yeah, uh, this is something we want to do, but we haven't done yet. In practice, it would be much easier to do for some small k because, um, yeah, it's harder to parameterize infinite resonances and this goes to zero, you see, very abruptly. But yeah, it's something we, we want to do. So one slightly tangential question, you mentioned the TT bar deformation in the beginning. So in TT bar, there is always this square root in the result. Mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, in principle, one could choose two different signs of the square root. Well, the second yeah. one is non-physical, but I wonder uh, uh, what uh, mm, yeah, do people think is the best interpretation for this sign uh, thing? Yeah, I think it was discussed some time ago. I would like to ask what is the present status? Um, yeah, I'm probably not the best person to yeah, do answer maybe this question, but I know yeah. for this negative sign, you usually think more of an effective theory that is valid up to that, that scale. This is for the first branch. And for the other branch, it's really an open, an open question. But I think it's nice to see that you can only have two branches. So maybe we should try to answer this question. <laughs> uh, so can you show this picture of monolith? from the beginning. Can I show the structure of? Uh, monolith. Uh, one first, first picture on your, on your slides. Uh, no. This? The very the first stone. one. <laughs> ah, the monolith. Sorry, I, I didn't hear what uh, This one, yes. Yes. Uh, so you say it's all the matrices with no bound states constrained in this region. Mm -hmm. So I believe then I could imagine that uh, big part of the boundaries is the places where some poles entering uh, as matrix to become bound states. It's my would guess would be. So there are some poles outside of the region when they can form bound states, they enter as matrix, 
and the, just reaching the point where we can bound, become bound, and this will be the boundary. This is, I would guess, so. Then, is it so? First question, and then if yes, then can you like make some kind of mass gap? So, requires it also quite far away. So maybe you can get isolated point or something. Yeah. Okay. So yes, in practice, if you have uh, some bound states, then basically you have both in the matrix. So this um, this picture. Uh, can go up because there are poles. Um, so let me explain this better. So here what I'm plotting is the three different channels you have for ON at some given point inside the physical strip. So if you can have poles inside the physical strip, then of course this space can be bigger. Um, in practice, for this as matrix bootstrap, since you need to fix uh, some ansatz for the S matrix, you are inputting the analytic structure. So you're really saying, OK, I have poles or no poles. So yeah, the way it's been done so far is that you fix the spectrum and get something. And then, OK, if you have bounces, you get something else. But it should be true something like you say, if you put some bound on the residue of the pole and change this parameter, you should be able to see how, uh, how this allowed region goes up and down. What is the question? <laughs> Roughly. So the question, uh, can you ask that poles do not approach even close to the physical uh, strip? So they on some distance from the physical strip. Can you ask this? And it would be a smaller thing. The poles, you mean the bound states or the ones coming from the resonance on the uh, second sheet? Th those who are not bound states. Some poles that are bound states, they can be very close to the uh, physical strip, mm -hmm. and they should be on the boundary of the monolith, such but series. But outside the, the physical strip? Yes, but very close. Can you in increase the gap? like? To yes, the, uh, so this, this is definitely inside this region here. Um, and yes, so another way to phrase what you're saying is, can you fix the mass of the resonances in the theory? And yes, you, you can do that and play this game. So for instance, if you want to find a particular model, like uh, the nonlinear sigma model, this is one way to do it. You fix the mass of the resonance, and you do get this point. So, so what if the parameter of the resonance is complex, like, like in the staircase model? Or yes. you have many staircase factors? Yes, yes, I, I should have said something about this. So thanks for the question. So um, in, in this paper by uh, some logicals, uh, well, all these authors, um, they explored precisely this question. So they considered two CD factors and all the ways in which you can move the, the, the zeros in the S matrix. And um, so they also saw that um, you always have two branches, and the critical radius would depend on these parameters. But uh, as I was showing, really what matters is just the norm of the kernel. So if you have two resonances, you will end up in the same UV uh, point. Okay. Huh? Yeah, but maybe it's also interesting how you approach, no? Because in, in the staircase model, not the very end is important, but all the way along you go and visit other minimal models. Right, but uh, yeah, if you have another CDD factor, then you won't have this, well, maybe you have some other, uh, I don't remember exactly what happens there in, in, in this other paper. But you have this other different behavior. So it's not like you're approaching some minimal models in the IR. OK. So uh, I have a final comment. Uh, I mean, this uh, uh, arch continuation mm -hmm. might be a very powerful method to study also excited state. Because yes, also in that case, have you tried that uh, for some simple model? Not yet, yeah. but it's in my to the list. Yeah, because it might be also useful for yeah, the SCFT. And we, I mean, we would need to mm. do this because most likely, if you do the excited TBA, you mm. will also get the singularities, etc. So you need to, to deal with this method, yes. 
Okay, thank you very much.